This is madness. Madness, I say. I haven't had a case in over two stinking lousy weeks. When's my luck gonna turn? Come in. It's Mickey! I need your help! That was the day. That was the day Mickey came to me. I couldn't say no after hearing his story. How what began as a simple birthday celebration became everything he ever wanted, and how just as quickly it was all taken away from him, leaving just enough to remind him of what once was. So I took the case to find out who was responsible. All right, Stitch, he's gone. Man. My friends were sweeping up the yard, but I didn't think anything of it. Everybody's so friendly and helpful here in Mickey's birthday land. <laughs> the origins of Mickey's Toontown goes all the way back to 1988, with the opening of Magic Kingdom's first new land in almost 20 years, Mickey's birthday land. Mickey first appeared on screen in 1928 in Steamboat Willie, so the iconic mouse's 60th anniversary was tied to a new land of the Magic Kingdom. <laughs> The premise of Mickey's Birthday Land was that Minnie Mouse was throwing him a surprise party, and of course, everyone at the park was invited. Decorated with signs and banners wishing Mickey a happy birthday, the official way to enter the new land was aboard the Main Street Railroad Station. On the ride over, you'd see various Disney characters also trying to make their way to the celebration. You arrived to this new land by way of the brand new Mickey's Birthday Land Station, and were greeted with a sign that welcomed you to the town of Duckburg. This was based off the fictional town as seen in the DuckTales comic books, and at the time, brand new animated series on the Disney Channel. This expansion of the Magic Kingdom featured three main attractions, a walkthrough of Mickey Mouse's house, which ended in a screening room, a separate meet and greet with the iconic character, and a live stage show that continued into a post-show. You can also notice another location with painted stripes, which was actually the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea show building, only painted to blend in. Mickey's house was a walkthrough that gave children and fans of the iconic Disney character a glimpse into his everyday life, such as his bedroom, den, and living room. But unlike later incarnations, these areas were roped off, keeping visitors at a distance. The tour finished in a screening room where Mickey Mouse cartoons were played for visitors. Anybody for a cheese sandwich? Over at Mickey's Hollywood Theater, you could find Mickey in his dressing room for a photo opportunity, presumably getting ready for his big birthday surprise. One quart of milk. <laughs> hey, Pluto, there are no dog bones, birthday cakes. <laughs> his birthday surprise revolved around a stage show, in which Mickey's friends were trying to make him a birthday cake, where of course shenanigans ensue and you're invited to watch. The show ended with Mickey arriving for a surprise, but this actually continued into another tent for the post-show, with Mickey and his pals dancing on top of a giant birthday cake. For all of you who have ever wondered where that song originally came from, you're welcome. Also part of Mickey's Birthday Land, aka Duckburg, visitors could stroll through the town and view storefronts and facades where supposedly the other Disney characters lived, worked, and shopped. The land also featured a petting zoo, a playground, and a maze where water would shoot up from the bushes at unsuspecting visitors. Whoops! Whoops again! <laughs> now to be honest, Magic Kingdom's new land was, how do I put this delicately, cheaply and quickly thrown together. It was more of a temporary solution to the many complaints about the lack of a designated place to meet the iconic character. However, Mickey's Birthday Land was more popular than Disney had anticipated, so in 1990 it was reworked as Mickey's Starland. This time, instead of just Mickey, Minnie, and the usual gang, the land featured many popular characters found on the Disney Channel. The only real drastic alteration came by way of a new stage show initially called Mickey's Magical TV World. The show initially featured characters from the Gummy Bears, DuckTales, and Chippendale Rescue Rangers, with Baloo and Louie from Tailspin included later that year. Other characters from Disney shows were removed, added, and swapped around over the first few years, but overall the basic narrative of the show remained the same. Hi, here's Boy! He's my pride and joy! What do you want? We play! Yeah. We have fun every day! 
However, on the other side of the coast, Disneyland was in the middle of plans to receive a major expansion that would feature an even bigger, better, and more expansive land dedicated to Mickey Mouse and all of his friends. I got my inspiration, as it were, from uh, Walt Disney, I think, I think it was on the 10th anniversary, where he said, we're just beginning. I couldn't believe watching television that Walt Disney said 10 years later, we're just beginning. And here I am 35 years later, feeling exactly the same way. Labeled as the Disney Decade, in the 1990s, the Anaheim Disney Park was to receive several major expansions and overhauls, which initially was to include a much more elaborate Mickey Starland. This was to open just in time for Mickey's 65th birthday. However, another expansion was Hollywoodland, the most ambitious and would conclude the Disney Decade. Hollywoodland was to be a larger version of Disney's upcoming Sunset Boulevard expansion at MGM Studios. Both Disneyland and Florida's version were to feature working trolley cars, an attraction based off the upcoming film Dick Tracy, with Disneyland to receive a copy of The Great Movie Ride. Another part of the expansion set for both parks were attractions based off the recent box office hit, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? At MGM, these would have been within a land called Maroon Studios or Roger Rabbit's Hollywood, but in Disneyland, it was to be a separate land within Hollywood Land, called Toontown. Unfortunately, due to a number of issues including legal hassles over Roger Rabbit, the disaster of Euro Disney and underperformance of Dick Tracy, much of the Disney Decade plans were scrapped. But not entirely. Mickey Starland and Toontown would be combined into a place where both Mickey Mouse and Roger Rabbit could call home. Mickey's Toontown. Aesthetically, it was heavily inspired by Who Framed Roger Rabbit's cartoon world as seen in the film, where the buildings and architecture were given a squish and squash look with virtually no straight edges. The various ideas and concepts for the Roger Rabbit attractions were instead combined into a single experience, Roger Rabbit's cartoon spin. Alongside Roger Rabbit, Mickey Mouse and all of his friends would reside on the other side of Toontown, and their houses would become attractions for visitors. <laughs> Mickey's Toontown began construction in 1992, built on the empty land behind It's a Small World, initially intended for Mickey Starland. Speaking of Mickey Starland, during Toontown's construction, the park would take inspiration from the Magic Kingdom in the form of Disney Avenue, where much like Starland, it was a temporary home for the stars of the Disney Channel. Guests could meet their favorite characters, see cheaply thrown together facades of where they lived, and view a special stage show called Disney Afternoon Live. I bring this up not just because of its birthday land similarities, or as an example of horrible attraction retheming, but because Toontown's future entrance was utilized as a meet and greet for Baloo from Tailspin. According to theme park historian Jim Hill, this was used as a sort of dry run for Toontown's Mickey Mouse meet and greet on how to handle guest flow and interactions. This didn't last long as soon the entrance was blocked off with the tease for visitors, and as Toontown grew closer to opening, you could catch a glimpse on the Disneyland Railroad. For the first time in over 20 years, a new land has been opened at Disneyland. It's Mickey's Toontown, home to Mickey Mouse and his friends Donald Duck, Goofy, Chip and Dale, Roger Rabbit, Minnie Mouse, and the rest of his cartoon pals. There's no question that the highlight of Mickey's Toontown was Roger Rabbit's cartoon spin and was met with unanimous praise, but if you visited the land during its soft opening, you had to rely on other experiences. Visitors could take a ride on the Jolly Trolley, a working trolley car which offered a tour slash shortcut through Toontown. For a roller coaster both kids and adults could enjoy, there was Gadget's Go Coaster. And next door was Chip and Dale's Treehouse, a tree fort of sorts just for kids, featuring a slide and ball pit. There was also Goofy's Bounce House, and while it was a major hit for kids, it was a disappointment if you were above 52 inches, as this was the maximum height allowed. There was also Donald's Boat, which featured a slide, spiral staircase, rope climb, and other fun activities for kids. Inside the Gag Factory gift shop, you'd see empty gloves on a conveyor belt traveling into a machine of sorts, coming out the other end with some sort of prop. Of course, one of the main draws of this land for kids was to meet Mickey Mouse and tour his home. It was called Mickey's Toontown after all. Unlike the Magic Kingdom, here you could actually explore the mouse's house and interact with decorations and set pieces. But if you were like me with an irrational fear of mascots, the walkthrough portion was the highlight, and you'd sort of just awkwardly run past the characters to the exit. I wish I were making that up. You could also visit Minnie Mouse's house, where just like Mickey, you could tour her fabulous and interactive home. 
There was also Toon Park, where parents could take a breather while kids enjoyed a playground, and even got to meet a few of their favorite characters. Of course, Toontown had many other things to do and see, but we're just focusing on the ones that pertain to this story and what comes later. By the way, if you want the official backstory of Toontown's existence, pause the video and read this description, as it's pretty clever but would take too long to read through the whole thing. As far as Toontown's overall reception, it was very mixed, as while kids such as myself loved all the fun things to do, many felt it didn't quite live up to expectations. But now it's time to head back on over to the Magic Kingdom, as with the opening of Disneyland's Toontown, it was time to make the Florida equivalent feel more permanent and less thrown together. Mickey and his friends have brought the county fair to town at Mickey's Toontown Fair. It's the place to meet your favorite characters. The backstory of this updated land was simple, a vacation spot for Mickey and his friends who lived in Disneyland's Toontown. Structurally, aside from the cheap facades, the only elements of Birthdayland slash Starland that was removed entirely was Mickey's Hollywood Theater, replaced with Minnie Mouse's house. The original location of the stage shows became the County Bounty. The main stage was now a massive gift shop, and the connected original post-show became the Hall of Fame, a place to meet the other Disney characters. Mickey's house was given a modest update as he traveled through his somewhat redecorated vacation home. The rooms, furniture, and personal possessions of Mickey now reflected the more cartoonish design of his Toontown location. Though for some reason, with the exception of his updated garage, guests were still not permitted to explore the rooms up close and were roped off. Since the Hollywood Theater was gone, Mickey's new meet and greet was over at the judge's tent behind Mickey's home. This was the original screening room, showing animated shorts only now themed as a film festival, and who best to judge his own cartoons than the mouse himself? Minnie's house at Disneyland was popular enough to warrant a version at the Magic Kingdom, where unlike Mickey's, you could actually explore the rooms and interact with the objects and set pieces. There was also Donald's bow, but was more of a decoration than something to explore. Finally, Mickey's Toontown Fair featured an actual rideable attraction, the Barnstormer at Goofy's Wiseacre Farm, which had replaced the petting zoo. The queue itself began in a farmhouse, or barn, giving visitors quite a bit to look at as they waited in line, including a glimpse of the coaster whizzing by. While the ride itself was identical to Gadget's Go Coaster, the section where you traveled through the barn past the visitors in the queue, hence the name Barnstormer, gave it a unique appeal. There's not much else to say about Toontown Fair, as it stayed virtually unchanged even past the 2000s. However, Mickey's Toontown at Disneyland had seen far better days. What's wrong with Toontown? Every Joe loves Toontown. They get Joe to do the job, cause I ain't going. If you first visited Toontown in the early 90s, and then later by the mid-2000s, you might have been shocked by just how much had been abandoned. First, you might have wondered, where was the iconic Jolly Trolley? Well, the trouble first began within months of opening, as they faced constant maintenance issues, including the second trolley car occasionally derailing from the tracks. So in 1994, the second trolley car was removed entirely. However, there was still the problem of a moving vehicle traveling the same pathway as countless pedestrians. Unfortunately, despite the Jolly Trolley being a Toontown icon, in 2003 this was shut down for good. The tracks were left behind and eventually a standalone, non-moving vehicle became a photo op. But that's okay, you may be thinking, at least there's Goofy's Bounce House. Unfortunately, this was also closed out of safety concerns, but since the attraction was one of the land's highlights, they simply took away the bouncy, fun part of the experience, becoming a playhouse with very little to play with. Okay, okay, but what about Chippendale's Treehouse? Well, I want to I want to slide, dang it. The slide is all blocked up now with concrete. Chippendale's treehouse wasn't safe either, as by this point it was decided to be far too dangerous for children. The slide had been removed due to a child, and I'm not making this up, breaking his leg on a decorative acorn. The ball pit was blocked off from visitors and was also removed in off limits due to more safety concerns, but this time regarding hygiene. Unfortunately, there's more. Donald's boat saw the removal of the slide out of even more safety concerns, as well as the children's entrance into the upper deck due to more safety concerns. The spiral staircase and rope climb were also now off limits, and eventually the staircase and entryway was removed entirely. Even the horn from the tugboat was turned off, allegedly from parents who complained about the constant noise. But Mark, I hear you asking, can I at least visit Toon Park with my kids? 
Yes, but without the fun, as Toon Park also fell victim to more safety concerns, and the playground was gutted and replaced with more benches. But to be fair, even McDonald's had the same issue post-1990s. At some point, the conveyor system in the gag factory was shut down as well, and for many years it was abandoned and left static. Eventually, the system was turned on again, but the empty gloves entering the machine was completely gone, now the equivalent of a joke with a punchline but no setup. Last was the removal of the goo effect in Roger Rabbit's cartoon spin. It really doesn't have much to do with Toontown's downfall, but it's something that's always bothered me. However, Mickey's Toontown fair at the Magic Kingdom was about to fare even worse. Thank you, I'm here all night. We are nearly doubling the size of Fantasyland to include more of your favorite princesses. Meeting a Disney princess is always a very special highlight. In part as a response to Universal's incredibly successful Wizarding World of Harry Potter, which Disney missed the chance to have for themselves as covered in a previous episode, Disney announced a drastic change to the Magic Kingdom. By this point, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea had long been abandoned and paved over, so it was decided to expand Fantasyland over this and its neighboring land, Toontown Fair. Initially, Toontown Fair was to become Pixie Hollow, which made sense to Disney since the Hall of Fame within the county bounty had been reworked into a fairy tale meet and greet. However, due to complaints about the expansion relying so heavily on meet and greets, this was soon reimagined. Mickey's Toontown Fair would become the storybook circus, perhaps as a nod to Disneyland's failed Mickey Mouse Club Circus. It actually has a pretty interesting history, so if it's something you want to see as a future episode, leave a comment down below. In February of 2011, Mickey's Toontown Fair was permanently closed and began a very lengthy demolition process. As part of the expansion, Dumbo would move to this new land with an impressive retheming, and while Goofy's Barnstormer would technically remain, it was rethemed as Fly with the Great Goofini. Unfortunately, the coolest part of the ride in which you traveled through the barn was removed as it didn't quite fit with this new idea, and sadly, nothing took its place, making the coaster even more generic. The basic structure of the original tents, which dated all the way back to Mickey's Birthday Land, were surprisingly saved, but that's about it. Explore sprawling kingdoms and make memories that you'll never, never forget at the new Fantasyland. The storybook circus opened to generally positive reactions, but you couldn't help but feel a little sad to no longer be able to walk through Mickey and Minnie's homes and their town. Mickey's meet and greet was moved over to the Main Street Town Square Theater, where inside you could find a few tributes and traces to his former home. Of course, Disneyland's Toontown still offers many of the experiences found in Magic Kingdom's various Mickey lands, but there's no denying that this section of the park has lost much of its luster. So Tokyo Disneyland's version of Toontown is the closest you'll get to the original version of the land, but even its version of the Jolly Trolley was closed in 2009. However, with the recent announcement of Mickey's Runaway Railway, it's possible Toontown will receive the much-needed love and attention it truly deserves. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and if you enjoyed the episode, give it a like and make sure to subscribe. Also make sure to check out the Yesterworld podcast, which can be found in the description below, and we'll see you next time on Yesterworld.